Hey, everybody, this is Allison Macrina from Library Freedom Project, and you're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I am your host, Carrie Parker, and this is episode 242 for October 18th, 2021. And uh, I've I've had a busy day actually. I don't usually record this like late on Saturday night, but I just had too much going on today. I woke up this morning, kind of took my morning constitutional, and then uh, my daughter and a friend of mine went to a wine festival at a really nice theater here in the area called Coca Booth. Um, it's a little outdoor venue uh, that I've been to several times before. Really, really nice. Uh, but they had lots of these booths set up where you could drink wine and sample even some distilled stuff, and then, you know, other kind of wine-related products. Uh, weather was absolutely beautiful. It was so nice just to kind of get out. Uh, and, I, and I got to got to admit, I got a little tipsy. Uh, I had my driving situation covered, however, so didn't have to worry about that. However, I came home, and I'm like, I've got to take a nap. So I, I was supposed to be doing this this afternoon. I took a nap, got up, went out with uh, two other friends of mine, and went to a comedy club that just opened, like, five minutes down the street from me, which is great, and saw Christopher Titus, uh, if you've ever seen him, he's a funny guy, but, you know, anyway, very social day for me today, and I came home, and like, man, I've got to get this done, so here it is, late Saturday night, and I am recording a podcast for you guys. So a few things today. We got a new show. I got a lot of subjects to cover today. Before I get to the summary of topics, a couple quick notes. First of all, you'll get two weeks left if you want to get that challenge coin. The challenge coin promotion for new patrons is open until November 2nd, so time is running out. We have gotten a new patron, uh, a new knight errant. We'll see if this knight would like their uh, their knighthood announced. Not all of them have, by the way. Uh, so if you wonder why we haven't had the little fanfare announcement, it's because not all the knight errants uh, actually wanted to, uh, to go public with their knight Knighthood, so I guess they're like special ops, black team, uh, knight errants. Anyway, if you want to, uh, if you want one of those really cool challenge coins, uh, you could, if you want to learn about them, first of all, go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com and look for the challenge coin promotion. Just search for that. It's, it's going to be one of the top couple, couple of links there. And you can get all the information there. You get to see pictures and a little video of it spinning and the whole bit in the background of what it's, what it's about. It's really cool. And I've got a, I've got a lot of compliments on this. I mean, for people that, collect challenge coins. I mean, even military people, like a lot of them are telling me this is one of the best coins they've ever gotten. So anyway, challenge coins is your thing. These are really nice coins, but they're, they're more than just a pretty face. They, uh, they, they're actually security enhancing devices. You can use them to generate passphrases on my website, d20key.com. And actually, if you go to that website, there's a tab there called coin that has uh, some more pictures and stuff about the coin. And you can see how you would use one to generate a random passphrase. So anyway, I think they're super cool. People who have gotten them have said they're really super cool. So time is running out and actually quantity is running out. There's only so many of these things that I have. And so get them while you can. I uh, also been doing some some webinars. I uh, I think I mentioned this a few times before, but I'm doing right now they're, they're free as long as they're not too big. Uh, yeah, I'm doing little Zoom calls and uh, I just did one for another class that uses actually uses my book for their the instructor uses my book to teach their class as well. And so he uh, because of COVID is doing them virtually, so I, he reached out and said, "Hey, would you mind sitting in and doing a little guest lecture for the class?" I said, "Sure." Uh, so I did that this week. That was a lot of fun. And I'm still teaching my class at Duke for, you know, for the seniors there, the part of the Ollie program. Really enjoy that. And I think I hope they're getting a kick out of it too. So, all right. So as I said, uh, we've got a new show for you today. So we're going to talk about the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission here in the U.S. I actually didn't know it's not like it's a new ruling. They've clarified some of their language about notifying customers about data breaches, which is a, a, a good move. We'll talk about that. The Missouri governor, for some reason, has decided to prosecute a local newspaper for pointing out that their website was freely giving up the social security numbers of well government workers i think it was we'll get into we'll, we'll talk about the story uh, and he's blaming the people that pointed it out which is beyond stupid we're going to get to another investigation that shows that despite of all apple's best efforts for blocking tracking uh, a lot of apps are basically still doing it which is not good and uh, i'll explain what i mean by that a company that routes billions of your text messages one that you've, I'm sure, have never heard of, just just quietly tried to announce that they had been open for data downloads by who knows who for I think like five years. Anyway, I'm pulling this from memory. We'll we'll talk about it and when I get to the article, get the details. There's been a lot of consolidation in the VPN industry. That's uh, bad news for people trying to figure out what the heck VPN they want to get and trying to read reviews to make that decision. And then Facebook has had a horrible horrible 
week or two recently. So we're going to talk about a few things around Facebook that have happened since the last news show that none of which are really good. Um, but you know, maybe it means that this, this is a turning point. Maybe this, you know, a lot, a lot of times it has to get bad before it gets better. So, uh, maybe, maybe that will be the silver lining in all of this. And then finally, actually kind of a couple tips of the week. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about windows 11 that has just been announced and whether or not your PC is compatible has been a very confusing subject. I'll tell you how to figure that out and whether or not you even really want to do it or wait. And then Firefox has started putting search, well, ad suggestions in the search bar. And I'm going to explain to you why they might be doing that, what it really means, because it might not be as bad as it sounds. But nevertheless, I'll tell you how to disable that. So, lots to talk about today. Let's get to the news. All right, first up, the Federal Trade Commission here in the United States, the FTC, uh, has released a new bit of verbiage about uh, what companies are supposed to be doing about data breaches. So instead of me describing it poorly, let me just read this article from TechCrunch. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission has warned apps and devices that collect personal health information must notify consumers if their data is breached or shared with third parties without their permission. In a 3-2 to two vote, and I'd love to know who the heck the two people were that said no to this, in a 3-2 to two vote on Wednesday, and this would have been, I think, last week or maybe the week before, the FTC agreed on a new policy statement to clarify a decade-old 2009 health breach notification rule, which requires companies handling health records to notify consumers if their data is accessed without permission, such as the result of a breach. This has now been extended to apply to health apps and devices, specifically calling out apps that track fertility data, fitness, and blood glucose, which, quote, too often fail to invest in adequate privacy and data security, unquote, according to FTC chair Lena Khan. And I hope I got that. It's Lena, L-I-N-A. And here's a quote directly from her. She says, quote, digital apps are routinely caught playing fast and loose with user data, leaving users' sensitive health information susceptible to hacks and breaches, unquote. And she said that in a statement pointing to a study published this year in the British Medical Journal that found health apps suffer from, quote-unquote, serious problems, ranging from the insecure transmission of user data to the unauthorized sharing of data with advertisers. There have also been a number of recent high-profile breaches involving health apps in recent years. Babylon Health, a UK AI chatbot and telehealth startup, last year suffered a data breach after a quote-unquote software error allowed users to access other patients' video consultations, while period tracking app Flow was recently found to be sharing users' health data with third-party analytics and marketing services. Under the new rule, any company offering health apps or connected fitness devices that collect personal health data must notify consumers if their data has been compromised. However, the rule doesn't define a quote-unquote data breach as just a cybersecurity intrusion. Unauthorized access to personal data, including the sharing of information without an individual's permission, can also trigger notification obligations. And this is another quote from Lena Khan. She says, quote, While this rule imposes some measure of accountability on tech firms that abuse our personal information, a more fundamental problem is the commodification of sensitive health information where companies can use this data to feed behavioral ads or power user analytics, unquote. If companies don't comply with the rule, the FTC said it will vigorously enforce fines of $43,792 per violation per day. Where the heck did that number come from? Anyway, there's more to this article than that, but... By the way, Lena Khan, uh, from what I've heard, is going to be an awesome person to head the FTC, and hopefully we will see more rulings like this or clarifications like this that will kind of bring these companies into some sort of account because they've been given free reign for way too long. All right, next up, this is really troubling, and it kind of just went down uh, last week, Last I think it was Friday, where this is really starting to uh, hit the Twitterverse. Uh, so by the time this comes out, maybe something will have changed, but um, I think it's important to bring it up just because this is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. It's not the first reaction like this that I've seen. And we really have got to fix this kind of stuff. Um, (laughs) This this can't be illegal. All right, so uh, here's an article from Krebs on security. On Wednesday, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch ran a story about how its staff discovered and reported a security vulnerability in a Missouri State Education website that exposed the social security numbers of 100,000 elementary and secondary teachers. In a press conference this morning, and this would have been last Friday, Missouri Governor Mike Parson said fixing the flaw could cost the state $50 million. 
I'm not sure where he gets that number, and vowed his administration would seek to prosecute and investigate the quote-unquote hackers and anyone who aided the publication in its, quote, attempt to embarrass the state and sell headlines for their news outlet, unquote. The Post-Dispatch says it discovered the vulnerability in a web application that allowed the public to search teacher certifications and credentials and that more than 100,000 Social Security numbers were available. The Missouri State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE, reportedly removed the affected pages from its website Tuesday after being notified of the problem by the publication and and then parenthetically it says, and this is crucial, before the story on the flaw was published. The newspaper said it found that teachers' social security numbers were contained in the HTML source code of pages involved. In other words, the information was available to anyone with a web browser who happened to also examine the site's public code using developer tools or simply right-clicking on the page and viewing the source code. Which, by the way, any of you could do right now, and I would recommend at some point you do that just to see what is going on behind the common web page today, because it's crazy. But yeah, just go to any web page that you are on right now, right-click, and do Show Source, and you'll see the the code, the HTML code and JavaScript code behind what makes that web page do what it's doing. And that's all these guys did. So anyway, back to the article. The Post-Dispatch reported that it wasn't immediately clear how long the social security numbers and other sensitive information had been vulnerable on the DESE website, nor was it known if anyone had exploited the flaw. But in a press conference Thursday morning, Governor Parson said he would seek to prosecute and investigate the reporter and the region's largest newspaper for, quote-unquote, unlawfully accessing teacher data. And this is a quote from uh, Governor Parson. He said, quote, This administration is standing up against any and all perpetrators who attempt to steal personal information and harm Missourians. It is unlawful to access encoded data and systems in order to examine other people's personal information. We are coordinating state resources to respond and utilize all legal methods available. My administration has notified the Cole County Prosecutor of this matter, and the Missouri State Highway Patrol's Digital Forensics Unit will also be conducting an investigation of all of those involved. This incident alone may cost Missouri taxpayers as much as $50 million, unquote. Now, there's a lot wrong with that, but some of that that gets exposed by other quotes later in this article. So let me keep going. While threatening to prosecute the reporters to the fullest extent of the law, Parsons sought to downplay the severity of the security weakness, saying the reporter only unmasked three social security numbers and that, quote, there was no option to decode social security numbers for all educators in the system all at once, unquote. Aaron Mackey, who we have had on the show before, is a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit digital rights group based in San Francisco. Mackey called the governor's response, quote, vindictive, retaliatory, and incredibly short-sighted, unquote. Mackey noted that Post-Dispatch did everything right, even holding its story until the state had fixed the vulnerability. He said that the governor also is attacking the media, which serves as a crucial role in helping give voice and often anonymity to security researchers who might otherwise remain silent under the threat of potential criminal prosecution for reporting their findings directly to the vulnerable organization. And this is a quote from uh, Aaron Mackey. says, quote, It's dangerous and wrong to go after someone who behaved ethically and responsibly in a disclosure sense, but also in the journalistic sense, unquote. Mackey said Governor Parson's response to this incident also is unfortunate because it will almost certainly give pause to anyone who might otherwise find and report security vulnerabilities in state websites that unnecessarily expose sensitive information or access, which also means such weaknesses are more likely to eventually be found and exploited by actual criminals. So, yeah, there is so much wrong with this. (laughs) Um, First of all, and and this has given rise to a new meme and T-shirts or whatever on the web, basically saying that F-12 is not a crime. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, F-12, I think on Windows maybe only, but F-12 is the function key on your your computer that would view the source code of a web page. So, yeah, the source code is not, <laughs> these guys aren't hacking anything. The information was right there. And then at one point he said, well, there's only three numbers. And it wasn't like you could get to all of them. All you had to do is go basically write a little program that would go through and each of those 100,000 teachers and very easily pull out that information for all of them. It, it would have been trivial for somebody to get all those social security numbers. So they reported privately. They didn't publish the article until it was fixed. They did the right thing. And it was not a hack. So anyway, I, I can't imagine this is actually, there's going to be anything to this other than harassing this newspaper, you know, and there'll be legal bills and crap like that. It's, but it's just, it's just dumb. I mean, it's, it's beyond wrong. It's just stupid. All right, moving on. Uh, there's been a couple articles I've seen lately. I think one was in the Washington Post. 
and I'm going to read you actually one from CPO Magazine that I think just kind of summarizes it well. But I've been wanting to talk about this for a little while. And, you know, Apple has tried to prevent companies from tracking you without your permission. And we saw this pop up in iOS 14.5 and those little messages saying this app would like to track you, yes or no, and giving people that choice. And they tried to, you know, put in some restrictions for the developers that, you know, if you're going to continue to develop for us, for us and get licenses from us to deploy your apps, then you've got to follow, you know, these guidelines. And basically, you're not supposed to track people if they don't want you to be tracked. And that is supposed to include not just this IDFA, which is this ID for advertising thing that would kind of uniquely identify you. But there are other ways that you can kind of identify people too, which this article is going to talk about, that you were also supposed to not be doing if they said they don't want to be tracked. But, you know, like anything, there's kind of gray areas and loopholes. And let me just read the article and you'll understand what I mean. Apple's new app tracking rules, the App Tracking Transparency Framework, set in place with the release of iOS 14.5 several months ago, are supposed to guarantee that users know when they are being identified and tracked by an ad-supported app and given the ability to opt out. A new study conducted by a company behind the ad-blocking app Lockdown and the Washington Post indicates that, at least in the early going, apps are continuing to find ways to identify and track users even after they choose to opt out. By and large, iPhone apps are respecting Apple's requirement to not access the Identifier for Advertisers, or IDFA, unique to each device. What they are not respecting is Apple's prohibition on device fingerprinting techniques as an alternate means of app tracking. A number of popular apps have been found to be continuing to send identifying combinations of data points to third-party tracking companies. In addition, ad performance tracking software tied to these advertising networks has been found to allow app developers to override user tracking preferences by simply flipping a toggle switch. The report scrutinized the permissions and data transfer of 10 popular and frequently downloaded apps, including games that the App Store recommends on its must playlist. All of these apps appear to be following the new app tracking rules, informing users upon download that the app would like to use the IDFA to gather information about device activity and use it to serve personalized ads. The apps also allow users to opt out as required. In the background, the apps continue to collect a series of data points that can identify the end user in the same way that the IDFA does. There are several dozen of these that are not enough to track a user on their own, but can be combined in unique ways to pinpoint an individual user with a high degree of accuracy as they browse the web or move on to different apps that are plugged into the same advertising network. For example, an app that does device fingerprinting might combine the user's time zone, language settings, cellular carrier, total storage space on device, audio settings, iPhone model, and preferred screen brightness into a profile that follows them around online. Some apps take an even more direct approach and simply access the device name that users are free to customize. When Apple rolled out its new app tracking rules for iOS 14, it expressly forbade using device fingerprinting as an alternative means of tracking. But so long as app developers keep their promise to not access the IDFA, There remains a great deal of wiggle room inside a cloud of lax enforcement and plausible deniability about what device settings and permissions are necessary for the app's core functions. App developers are sending this device fingerprinting data to outside advertising firms. The report claims Chartboost and Vungle are two commonly used popular App Store apps. With millions of apps to oversee, Apple mostly relies on users flagging and reporting to identify apps that might be breaking these rules. But this fingerprinting process is not transparent or even evident to the user, requiring an above-average level of technical investigation to identify. The researchers flagged their findings and sent them to Apple, but reported that after several weeks the company had taken no action. The study found that opting out of app tracking only reduced the amount of fingerprinting activity by about 13%. All right, so we saw this coming. We knew this was going to happen. And in the end, what we are waiting for is to see how Apple responds to this. And this article's right. It's not easy to do. Your phone, trying to be helpful, has lots of sensors and lots of information that it can provide to these applications or websites that you visit to try to, you know, make for a better experience when they return that web page to you. It's helpful for them to know things like how big is your screen, what operating system you're on, what version you're running, what app you're on. You know, those are all things that can help it provide better, you know, a better experience for you. However, you can also, you can see for some of these really weird things like, you know, why are you going to give an app access to your exact battery level, your exact storage remaining, or, you know, I mean, all of these things come up with arguments why they might need that information, which is why this is so gray, why this is so muddy. But the fact is that if you take enough of these things, these 
measurements together uh, and put them together into like a super set of information, it makes it for a pretty unique fingerprint for that device. Now, one of the things that Google, has, of all people, has put out there that I think might be interesting in cases like this is they've actually come up with a like a data or information budget. And what they kind of did was, and, and again, I can't believe it's Google that did this. I'm not sure how useful this has been for Chrome. Probably not. But they basically say, okay, you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. So, you know, you've got a budget. And how much do you want to spend on that budget of information? So pick carefully the things that you really need to know to do what you have to do. And don't ask for more than that because you're going you're gonna to blow your budget. And so we could, Apple could, go through and look at all the various things that it could report back when asked that would give, you know, this app potentially information that would help them serve you better and say, okay, well, this, this, this information is worth this much. This information is worth that much. And, you know, put scores on all of these things and say, okay, there's your price list. Here's your budget. How much of that do you want? How much of that do you really need? Because you can't go over budget. And basically if they did that right, what hopefully would happen is they would not be able to get enough information to uniquely identify you, but they would hopefully still be able to provide you with good service. Anyway, that is an option. I mean, obviously what we really need to do is just to prevent these guys legally from abusing that data and doing it for anything other than serving you. And I don't mean by serving you ads. I mean by doing things that make your life better and <laughs> targeted ads don't. Okay. All right. Let me move on. And I, this, this is an article from Vice, uh, which either owns Motherboard or Motherboard owns Vice. I don't know, but they're together. Let me just read this article about this company that you've never heard of that is routing most of our text messages that was uh, wide open for hacking. A company that is a critical part of the global telecommunication infrastructure used by AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and several others around the world, such as Vodafone and China Mobile, quietly disclosed that hackers were inside its systems for years, impacting more than 200 of its clients and potentially millions of cell phone users worldwide, probably more than that. The company, Cineverse, that's S-Y-N-I-V-E-R-S-E, -E, revealed in a filing dated September 22nd with the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, that an unknown, quote, individual or organization gained unauthorized access to databases within its network on several occasions, and that login information allowing access to or from its electronic data transfer environment was compromised for approximately 235 of its customers, unquote. A former Cineverse employee who worked on the EDT system told Motherboard that those systems have information on all types of call records. Cineverse repeatedly declined to answer specific questions from Motherboard about the scale of the breach and what specific data was affected, but according to a person who works at a telephone carrier, whoever hacked Cineverse could have had access to metadata such as length and cost, caller and receiver's numbers, the location of the parties in the call, as well as the content of SMS text messages. The company wrote that it discovered the breach in May 2021, but that the hack began in May of 2016. Cineverse provides backbone services to wireless carriers like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and several others around the world. The company processes more than 740 billion text messages every year and has quote-unquote direct connections to more than 300 mobile operators around the world, according to its official website. 95 of the top 100 mobile carriers in the world, including the big three U.S. ones and major international ones such as Telefonica and America Mobile or Mobile, are Cineverse customers, according to the filing. And this is a, a response from Karsten Knoll, who's a security researcher who studied this stuff for a long time. Uh, and she told Motherboard, she says, quote, Cineverse has access to the communication of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world. A five-year breach of one of Cineverse's main systems is a global privacy disaster. Cineverse systems have direct access to phone call records and text messaging and indirect access to a large range of internet accounts protected with SMS two-factor authentication. Hacking Cineverse will ease access to Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, and all kinds of other accounts all at once, unquote. That means the recently discovered and years-long data breach could potentially affect millions, if not billions, of cell phone users, depending on what carriers were affected, according to an industry insider who asked to remain anonymous as he was not authorized to speak to the press. And this next is another quote to Motherboard from a, what they're calling a telecom industry insider who asked to be anonymous. 
Um, and this quote says, with all that information, I could build a profile on you. I know exactly what you're doing, who you're calling, what's going on. I'll know when you get a voicemail notification. I'll know who left the voicemail. I'll know how long that voicemail was left for. When you make a phone call, I'll know exactly where you made that call from. I'll know more about you than your doctor, unquote. The hack is already raising the alarm in Washington. And this is a quote from Ron, Senator Ron Wyden. And he, in an email statement to Motherboard, he said, quote, The information flowing through Cineverse's systems is espionage gold. That this breach went undiscovered for five years raises serious questions about Cineverse's cybersecurity practices. The FCC needs to get to the bottom of what happened, determine whether Cineverse's cybersecurity practices were negligent, identify whether Cineverse's competitors have experienced similar breaches, and then set mandatory cybersecurity standards for this industry, unquote. So that was the expurgated version. There's a lot more to it, as usual, as I read these articles. Uh, all the links are in the show notes, so if you want to read the whole thing, go there. But yeah, this is this is bad. Um and I, I think, you you know, they probably drew in on the right thing. I mean, all that metadata is surveillance gold, not just espionage gold, but surveillance gold. I mean, for for all sorts of people who might abuse that data. So really, really not good. And uh, I hope they investigate and get to the bottom of that and come out the other side with some changes that will make everything better. All right, next up. This is a really, really bad trend, and it's something that you would not know if you were not listening to this podcast or maybe reading some of the things that I read. And the VPN industry has always been kind of honestly shady, especially some of the free ones and, you know, even some of the review sites. And this is true for a lot of software sites. Actually, there's a, you know, you sign up for an affiliate link and they'll, and they say, you know, if you, uh, if you click this link, you'll get, you know, a discount, but you know, they'll also get a kickback and, you know, that is going to flavor your results a little bit. Um, so, you know, there's always this, you know, kind of a, conflict of interest going on there anyway, but it's actually a lot worse than that. And this article will help you understand that and explain why it's gotten really bad recently. So this is, uh, this is from windscribe.com. And I think these guys are VPN reviewers, so they've got their own ax to grind here, but, uh, I, I still thought it was, you know, well-written in terms of calling out what's going on here. So here's part of that article. It says, most of you have probably been living your lives to the fullest, happily unaware of the dramas unfolding in the VPN industry. Well, that's about to change. Our industry is in deep trouble and user privacy is hanging in the balance. Over the last several years, there has been a significant amount of consolidation happening in both the consumer VPN industry and the mostly parasitic VPN quote-unquote review industry. The majority of these acquisitions were undertaken by two entities. Uh, J2 Global is the digital publishing company that owns IGN, Mashable, PC Mag, and other properties that derive their revenues through ads. They also own several SAAS or software as a service companies that offer various digital services, including several VPNs. And this is a list of all the companies that J2 Global has acquired and when. IP Vanish, 2019. Strong VPN, 2019. IB VPN, 2020. Safer VPN, 2019. Encrypt.me, 2019. Buffered VPN, 2019. Noticing any conflicts of interest? It's pretty dishonest for media companies that actively engage in VPN reviews to own the VPN services they themselves review. Sure, they provide a one-liner disclosure of ownership, but the vast majority of people will easily miss it when they sign up. And this is the second company, Cape Technologies. Cape Technologies used to be known as CrossRider. CrossRider specialized in adware and browser hijacking software, but in 2018, they switched gears and became a cybersecurity company. Go figure. The primary investor for both of these companies is a man named Teddy Sagi. I think it's Sagi, S-A-G-I. Teddy is an elusive Israeli billionaire who also served prison time for bribery and fraud back in 1996. Crossrider, now rebranded as Cape Technologies, then went on an acquisition spree and started buying up VPNs. And this is their list. They bought CyberGhost in 2017 for about $10 million, Zenmate in 2018 for about 5 million euro, Private Internet Access acquired in 2018 for about $100 million, and ExpressVPN acquired this year for almost a billion dollars. This is where things get shady. In 2021, Kate made another acquisition, but this time it was for a company called Websolence, a marketing firm that holds two properties, VPN Mentor and Safety Detectives, both of which are VPN review sites. Kate paid $149 million for this company. Just think about that for a second. Those two VPN review sites are worth more than all of their previous acquisitions combined. And that's because they acquired ExpressVPN later. 
Why does a quote-unquote technology company that owns a bunch of VPNs need a VPN review site? The answer to that is obvious, self-promotion. Let's have a look at the top three quote-unquote best VPNs as suggested by VPN Mentor as displayed on their homepage. And of course, you can't see this, but the article describes what you're about to see and it says, wow, surely this is a coincidence. Three of the four highest valued Kate properties are the quote-unquote best VPNs, according to a major VPN review site owned by Cape. If you think this is a one-off situation in the VPN world, think again. VPNRanks.com is another rating site, and guess who owns it? If you guessed it's owned by PureVPN, you are right. And guess who they listed as the best VPN? If you guessed PureVPN, you are right again. They only just recently downgraded themselves to a lower ranking. Very classy of them. The VPN industry is dirtier than a dirt road at a dirt farm. Companies constantly make false promises of privacy, security, and anonymity every chance they get. They then pay every YouTuber out there to parrot these false claims and make it incredibly difficult to cancel memberships when users figure out they've been duped. When you do end up canceling and hit up a quote-unquote trusted VPN review site to find another service, you inadvertently end up subscribing to a VPN owned by the same entity you think you just parted ways with. This takes deception and dishonesty to a whole new level. So then the article goes on to describe why <laughs> their VPN reviews are fine. So yeah, sure, okay. But anyway... So the real issue here is there's, I mean, yeah, they probably, if they're, if they're good about this and covering their legal butts, they probably are putting a little link somewhere or a little asterisk somewhere saying, oh, by the way, the same parent company that owns this review site also owns these top rated VPNs, but that would be very easy to mess and you've probably not seen it. I mean, this, honestly, I would think this is something that like the Federal Trade Commission should be stepping in on. I mean, this, this, this just doesn't seem right to me, but Anyway, it's just something to be aware of. Now, there's been other problems with ExpressVPN, actually. Um, now, because of this, I actually switched from ExpressVPN. I'm now using NordVPN. I was very happy with ExpressVPN. I mean, technically speaking, I think they did a great job. But, you know, this kind of stuff bothers me. And I, you know, I can't say I always take a stand like this. I understand, you know, in some cases, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to switch over something like this. But it's at least you need to understand what's going on and know that a lot of these review sites can't be trusted and you got to be really careful. Now, there's a, another article that I, I don't think I really have time to read today that you might want to get into. It, it, it's called Trust But Verify, an in-depth analysis of ExpressVPN's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad week. That's really uh, a pretty good article. It's on ZDNet. And it kind of goes through this cost-benefit analysis like, okay, here's what happened. Here's why it's bad. And do you still want to be using ExpressVPN or not? And it doesn't just de-jerk say, you know, no, you know, cancel, cancel them, you know, move on to something else. I can understand why some people will do that. But it, I mean, the, the author of the article, you know, takes a nuanced approach, which is, you know, kind of a breath of fresh air. Anyway, so there's a link to the show notes for that. Or if you just want to go to ZDNet and, you know, search for Trust But Verify, you'll probably find that article. All right, next up, I've got three articles, ex, you know, excerpts from articles to read to you about Facebook. So a couple things happened that were, by the way, completely unrelated. And as far as we can all tell, completely coincidental. And after you hear these articles, I think you'll agree. First of all, uh, they had a huge outage for like six hours on a, last Monday or the Monday before. I think it was the Monday before that, you know, everybody felt because it was Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram, all of which, of course, are owned by Facebook. And so, uh, first of all, I want to explain what happened there without getting super technical, but I want you to understand what happened there. And the other thing, of course, was that a whistleblower came forward and gave a lot of information to, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, I forget which, both of which behind a paywall, so I was not able to read the articles. Uh, but of course, I've read a lot of derivative stuff on that, and we're going to quote one of those today about Facebook knowing full well that what they were doing was was hurting people and you know, raising the risk of really bad outcomes with certain demographics and, you know, and to put profits ahead of that. And so, you know, that first of all, you know, it was an anonymous whistleblower you know, behind the Facebook files was what they're calling it, you know, with all interesting information there. And then that person was on 60 Minutes and revealed herself. And then she also testified in front of Congress. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about all of that right now. Let's start with the outage. So this is from The Verge, and it's just kind of a short blurb. And then I've got a, something after that that we'll talk about that helps explain it. So from The Verge, it says, Facebook said in a blog post Monday night, and of course, this was October 4th when this was written, so that the six-hour outage that took it offline, along with Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Oculus VR, was the result of a configuration change to its routers, not a hack or attempt to get at user data. 
While the initial explanation didn't really explain things, a subsequent blog post on Tuesday went into way more detail, saying that the outage was due to a routine maintenance mistake that basically disconnected Facebook's data centers from the internet. The outage began around 11.40 a.m. Eastern Time on that Monday and led to widespread problems for the company. It was Facebook's worst outage since 2019 when the site was down for more than 24 hours. Employees were unable to connect with each other on company message boards, and some told The Verge they were using work-provided Outlook email accounts to communicate. The problems cascaded to affect the servers that advertised Facebook's DNS and BGP information. That failure wiped out the DNS routing information that Facebook needs to allow other networks to find its sites. So (laughs) at the end of the day, and Facebook and Google and a lot of these really big companies that basically have their own section of the internet backbone, I mean, they've got really heavy duty, crazy network stuff happening that they control. And somebody fat fingered a config change. Um, I actually, if I, if I remember right, it was, they were, they were doing some maintenance, which, you know, may have required them to take down a, an internet route, for example, to do some testing on it and keep it off the internet while they tested it and then they'll bring it back. Uh, but somehow there was some cascading error and problem in this thing that caused all of them to go offline. And how could that happen? <laughs> how, how does, how does a single configuration do that? Well, It all comes down to this little thing that we call BGP, or Border Gateway Protocol. And it's something we don't talk about much, but honestly, it's one of the weakest parts of our entire internet. It's really pretty scary how powerful this is and how easy it is to screw something up. And, you know, Facebook, who wrote tools for this, tried to cover all the error cases and prevent bad things from happening and prevent humans from doing things like this, and it still failed. Hit some sort of sort of weird edge case that snuck through something somebody didn't test that caused this outage. So what I want to do now is the Cloudflare, again, uh, a great company who's doing some really good stuff. And I've had John Graham coming, the CTO. Uh, he's been on the show, I think, five times now. Great guy. Um, anyway, so they uh, they wrote a little article about this. And the section I want to read to you is uh, called Meet BGP. And so it kind of explains this. And so I'll walk through their explanation, and then I'll talk a little bit more when it's over. So... BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol. It's a mechanism to exchange routing information between autonomous systems, or AS, on the internet. The big routers that make the internet work have huge, constantly updating lists of possible routes that can be used to deliver every network packet to their final destinations. Without BGP, the internet routers wouldn't know what to do, and the internet wouldn't work. The DNS is literally a network of networks, and it's bound together by BGP. BGP allows one network, say Facebook, to advertise its presence to other networks that form the internet. As we write, and this was was a blog that was live blog during the outage, so uh, that's why they kind of make these references. As we write, Facebook is not advertising its presence. ISPs and other networks can't find Facebook's network, and so it is unavailable. The individual networks each have an ASN, an Autonomous System Number. An Autonomous System, AS, is an individual network with a unified internal routing policy. An AS can originate prefixes, which parenthetically it says, in other words, they say they control a group of IP addresses, as well as transit prefixes, and and parenthetically they say, say they know how to reach a specific group of IP addresses. Cloudflare's ASN is AS13335. Every ASN needs to announce its prefix routes to the internet using BGP. Otherwise, no one will know how to connect and where to find us. At 1558 UTC, we noticed that Facebook had stopped announcing the routes to their DNS prefixes. That means that, at least, Facebook's DNS servers were unavailable. Meanwhile, other Facebook IP addresses remained routed but weren't particularly useful since without DNS, Facebook and related services were effectively unavailable. We keep track of all the BGP updates and announcements we see in our global network. At our scale, the data we collect gives us a view of how the internet is connected and where the traffic is meant to flow from and to everywhere on the planet. A BGP update message informs a router of any changes you've made to a prefix advertisement or entirely withdraws the prefix. We can clearly see this in a number of updates we receive from from Facebook when checking our time series BGP database. Normally, this chart is fairly quiet. Facebook doesn't make a lot of changes to its network minute to minute. But at around 1540 UTC, we saw a peak of routing changes from Facebook. That's when the trouble began. Okay, so it goes on. But here's the thing. So I think the best description I've heard of, you know, understanding DNS and BGP is the following. 
DNS tells you where to go. BGP tells you how to get there. So DNS is the phone book of the internet. You can, you know, if I know someone's name and city, you know, in the old days, I'd break out the yellow, or the white pages, look them up, and that would give me their address and, and or phone number. But if I, want to, if I want to drive to their house, you know, I look up their address. So that's, that's knowing where to go. Knowing how to get there, that's a map and a series of roads or a GPS that will give me directions maybe is a, a better analogy. So once I take facebook.com and look it up in DNS and come back with its IP address, now I need to know, okay, fine. Now I've got the IP address. Now how do I actually route my data from where I am, my IP address, to Facebook's IP address? And that's where BGP comes in. So this protocol allows big routers, actually any router, but the ones we're talking about here are kind of the big backbone routers of the internet. They kind of advertise this, say, hey guys, all, whoever can hear me, uh, if you see an IP address in this range, send it to me. I'm serving those IP addresses. So, and that just kind of propagates and, the, and, and goes from router to router to router. And it kind of spreads out so that all the routers are kind of aware, at least on a hop by hop basis, how to get to the next hop for this IP address. So here's an IP address. Uh, look, I don't know where this goes, but I do know that if it's in this range, I send it to this other router and he knows more. So, you know, so now your data has moved forward in the internet to the next router, the next hop. And so at that hop, you know, through BGP, it's got a list uh, of general ad, you know, IP address ranges and knows that, okay, well, if I get an IP address in this range, I need to send it on to either this router or that router. And because there's a lot of redundancy in the internet. So it's not just one route, kind of like on a map, right? There's more ways. There's many ways to get to one spot usually uh, until you get to the very end where you might have to go down that one street because that's where the house is. But I mean, there's many highways between California and New York. You know, if you're trying to go from one house in New York to one house in California, you can get there a lot of different ways, right? Anyway, so this BGP is basically all these routers declaring to the internet, hey, when you see these addresses, send them, send them to me. Or alternatively, hey, if you see these addresses, I, they're not me, but I know how to get them there. So if you send it to me, I can at least send it to the next location. So somebody, while trying to do some sort of maintenance in Facebook, screwed that up and did it so royally that first of all, all of Facebook's DNS servers, the, the phone books that we all need to go look up and figure out their IP addresses, they went offline. So nobody could figure out to get to those, but your DNS is cached. Like it, they, they remember things like, okay, for a certain amount of time, if I, ha if I, I don't need to ask for this address again, cause it's probably the same. I don't need, you know, I've got this year's phone book, right. But you know, when next year rolls around, well, maybe I better, you know, get next year's phone book in case somebody moved. Right. So <laughs> it's that kind of a thing, but you know, even after a while, you know, that breaks down. Like they're like, okay, it's been too long now. I need to go and make sure I've got the right address. And now like, wait a minute, where, where did Facebook's DNS servers go? I, I need to ask where to, where to, you know, what IP address to send this to. And I can't even get that anymore. And it, it, it gets worse than that actually internally, be, you know, because we all use the internet for everything, right? They've got badges that I, I heard this by the way, that, that they have badges, they go to swipe and, but the, the network was down. So they couldn't authenticate their badges. They couldn't get into some of the facilities they needed to, to actually go and fix this problem. And I don't know if this is true. And I think I mentioned this before on another podcast, it might be apocryphal, but I actually heard at one point, they actually had to cut into a door to get through because the badge access was broken uh, because of the same problem. So anyway, that, <laughs> that is what happened to Facebook. The, and the real takeaway for you guys from all this is to understand that this, there's this thing called BGP that's really, really powerful. And if someone were to maliciously screw it up, or in this case, it wasn't malicious, it was just an accident. It could get into some serious problems. Now, there are some safeguards built in, but nevertheless, they're not, I don't think they're sufficient. I, this has been a weak link in the internet's armor for a long time. And, you know, maybe this will finally get people out there to, uh, to come up with some more robust solutions to, to make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen again. Okay. There's another story about Facebook that I snuck in here too. Um, that's yet another thing that they did that it was not good. Completely unrelated to the rest of them, but uh, let me read this article from The Verge about a guy who tried to help you out, and uh, Facebook said, sorry, no, you're out. A developer who made a tool that let everyone automatically unfollow friends and groups on Facebook says he's been banned permanently from the social networking site. Louis Barclay was the creator of 
Unfollow Everything, a browser extension that allowed Facebook users to essentially delete their news feed by unfollowing all their connections at once. Facebook allows users to individually unfollow friends, groups, and pages, which removes their content from the news feed, the algorithmically controlled heart of Facebook. Barclay's tool automated this process, instantly wiping users' news feed. As Barclay wrote of his experience using the tool in a recent article for Slate, and this is a quote from Barclay, he said, I still remember the feeling of unfollowing everything for the first time. It was near miraculous. I had lost nothing since I could still see my favorite friends and groups by going to them directly, but I had gained a staggering amount of control. I was no longer tempted to scroll down an infinite feed of content. The time I spent on Facebook decreased dramatically. Overnight, my Facebook addiction became manageable. And back to the article, it says, In response, Facebook sent Barkley a cease and desist letter earlier this year saying he'd violated the site's terms of service by creating software that automated user in interactions. Barkley says the company then, quote, permanently disabled my Facebook and Instagram accounts, unquote, and then, quote, demanded that I agree to never again create tools that interact with Facebook or its other services, unquote. Barkley notes that in addition to helping users, his Unfollow Everything tool was being used by researchers at the Swiss University of, and I'm not going to get this right, Neuchâtel, Neuchâtel, to study the effects of the news feed on people's happiness. He says he couldn't risk tangling in court with a trillion-dollar company like Facebook, and so simply remove the tool. The episode neatly illustrates Facebook's approach to its user base and how it often wants to give people the feeling of control without letting them fully escape its grasp. The company is happy to let users unfollow people individually, but automating the process would make it too easy to opt out of the news feed, which is essential for keeping users coming back and lining Facebook's pockets with advertising revenue. So, of course, tools like Barclays, even if they have limited uptake, are forbidden. Not a whole lot to add to that. I'm sure that it was a violation of their terms of service. I'm sure that somewhere in the agreement when you signed up for Facebook, it, it did say just that. So... Legally, I'm sure Facebook was within its rights to do what it did. And if he had sued, I don't know that he would have won. But it's good that we know that it happened, and it's good that we understand that Facebook is doing things like this. Which leads to the final note about the whole whistleblower thing. This Francis Hogan, H Hagen Hogan, H-U-G-E-N. I'm going to go with Hogan. Testified in front of Congress, and uh, this is an excerpt from the Washington Post article about that. It says... Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan on Tuesday told lawmakers that the company systematically and repeatedly prioritized profits over the safety of its users, painting a detailed picture of an organization where hunger to grow governed decisions with little concern for the impact on society. Her Senate committee testimony, based on her experience working for the company's Civic Integrity, Integrity Division and thousands of documents she took with her before leaving in May, sought to highlight what she called a structure of incentivization created by Facebook's leadership and implemented throughout the company. By directing resources away from important safety programs and encouraging platform tweaks to fuel growth, these performance metrics dictated operations, Hogan said, and a design that encouraged political divisions, mental health harms, and even violence. She pointed to Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg as the enforcer of this system, arguing that he controls the most important decisions made at the company. Which, by the way, because he is the majority shareholder. So he basically does rule that company. And this is a quote from her. She says, Until the incentives change, Facebook will not change. Left alone, Facebook will continue to make choices that go against the common good, our common good, unquote. The hearings signaled the start of a new crisis for Facebook in Washington, galvanizing lawmakers from both parties around regulatory efforts to tamp down on what they say is a wide-ranging set of societal ills prompted by the social media giant. Repeatedly, senators compare the company to big tobacco, purveyors of products that are addictive and profitable but ultimately bad. The tobacco industry was ultimately contained by landmark legislation, an action lawmakers promised to replicate. The Senate panel hearing was Hogan's first public appearance after she revealed herself Sunday evening as the source of thousands of pages of internal company research leaked to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and the Wall Street Journal. Throughout, Hogan gave a detailed account of the ways she said Facebook employees are incentivized to turn a blind eye to problems its services cause, coupling her own experiences at the company with data from the internal Facebook documents she took with her. Already, revelations from the documents have intensified concerns on Capitol Hill about Facebook's influence, particularly on children and teens' mental health, a topic expected to be the key focus of the hearing. But Hogan and lawmakers covered huge swaths of ground, touching on national security risks, the spread of misinformation, and the deadly mob attack on the Capitol on January 6th. 
Hogan also said she provided documents to Congress that showed Zuckerberg knew the company could have intervened to prevent the spread of hate speech and misinformation in at-risk countries, but he did not because it would have negatively affected, quote, meaningful social interaction, unquote, a key metric Facebook uses to measure communications between family and friends. Hogan said the company tied the metric to employees' bonuses and chose not to make changes that could cost Facebook money. Engagement-based ranking, which Facebook uses to prioritize posts and people's feeds that are most likely to elicit reactions, and therefore clicks, also concerned Hogan. The downside is the recommendation of divisive or harmful content. That has led Facebook's algorithms causing teens to be exposed to more anorexia content, encouraging rifts within families, and fueling ethnic violence in Ethiopia, she told lawmakers. All right, so again, there's there's a lot more to this, and you've, but you've probably seen a lot of this already covered on the news. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I brought it up here and kind of talked about it a little bit. Again, if you haven't watched The Social Dilemma, uh, the documentary on Netflix, that's a great place to start. But yeah, this is this is a real problem. And, you know, before the election, like a little before the election last year, Facebook, you know, dialed back some of its algorithms to try to prevent some of, you know, the more incendiary stuff from being shared. But as soon as the election was over, like, uh, you know, they turned this right back off because it's a moneymaker for them. I mean, they're all about engagement. And so their algorithms are dialed in for an engagement. And unfortunately, the things that keep people the most engaged today, sadly, is anger and fear. And so, you know, once you start going down some of these rabbit holes, the algorithm just keeps feeding you more because that's what's keeping you, quote unquote, engaged. And I have no doubt that, you know, that there are folks within Facebook that understand that this has got negative consequences. Obviously, the algorithm in and of itself doesn't sound evil, and I, don't, and I don't think it is. But the effects are bad, and it's time we call that out. And you know, I'm not sure what the solution there is, but we've got to do something about this. Okay, so i got a couple tips of the week for you uh, this week. First of all, Windows 11 just came out uh, last week, week before. It's been available. Uh, if you have a Windows 10 PC... Uh, you've probably gotten some pop-ups about this. If not, you can go into software update and kind of query and it'll tell you, hey, there's, you know, Windows 11 is out there. And by the way, your computer may or may not support this. And it should tell you kind of there. But there is a nice little tool that you can get from Microsoft that supposedly will, it's called Health Check. And you can download this this thing from uh, Microsoft that will also run this check and tell you. I have heard that it's <laughs> confusing. Like sometimes, you know, in your settings, in your Windows update settings, it'll say you're not compatible, but the the check tool will say that you are. Honestly, the, you know, the real problem here is that whether or not your PC supports it really has more to do with marketing than it does technical issues. Microsoft has decided that only certain, you know, PCs are going to qualify for this. And of course, because it's, you know, it's really a marketing and arbitrary thing, a line they set in the sand. Uh, there are already people out there that are finding ways around this and installing it anyway. I'm just going to read a really short little blip on this. And then uh, if you want to find this check tool, uh, you can go to the show notes and get it. Uh, but it says, uh, let me just read real quick from CNET. It says, Windows 11 dropped last week and it came with significant compatibility questions. The question of compatibility has been on a lot of PC users' minds since Microsoft unveiled its first major Windows upgrade in six years over the summer. Fortunately, Windows 11 should work with most PCs, according to a company blog post. However, Though Windows 11's release date has finally arrived, compatible devices won't necessarily get the upgrade yet. Microsoft says you might have to wait until mid-2022 to download and install Windows 11. Now that seems kind of weird, but okay. Annoyingly, Microsoft's own tool for determining device compatibility, the PC Health Check app, wasn't up to par when Microsoft first announced Windows 11. So the company temporarily removed the app. But Microsoft's PC Health Check is now back online and in working order. The app will tell you if your computer meets the requirements to run Windows 11. And if the PC doesn't, the, P the tool will tell you why and provide links for more support. So I, actually, you could probably just go to your favorite search engine and search for PC Health Check Microsoft, and you'll probably get a link right to it. But should you upgrade to Windows 11? From everything I've heard, it's really just an incremental release. I mean, honestly, under the covers, this code hasn't changed in a very long time. They keep putting new you know, marketing terms on it, but, uh, you know, the real software under the covers has not really changed that much. Now, there's some, you know, look and feel changes. You know, they've rounded the edges on some of the windows. They've moved the start stuff to the middle of the screen. Uh, you know, that's all cosmetic. So I, I'm sure there's some features in Windows 11 that are interesting. I... I... <laughs> I haven't seen anything super compelling yet, and it seems like it's not fully baked anyway. So I don't think there's a big rush to get into Windows 11. Uh, I was really hoping that a Windows 11 home version, the one that everybody gets, 
not the Pro and not the Enterprise version. Most people don't get that or pay for that. When you buy a computer off the shelf, it's going to have Windows 10 11, and, or it's going to have Windows 10 Home or Windows 11 Home on it. Still doesn't have BitLocker available to encrypt your hard drive. That is just ridiculous. I was really hoping that with 11, they were going to change that. You know, maybe someday they will. But again, it's just a moniker. Uh, Windows 11 is the same thing as Windows 10 with just some window dressing changes. So anyway, I wouldn't rush out to get it right away. But if you want to find out if your PC is even going to support it, uh, you can run that tool and it will tell you. All right, next up, and this is kind of a bittersweet story. Um, Firefox has now, in Firefox version 93, added search suggestions to your taskbar. Now, you're already getting them anyway, but before, you were only getting them from your designated search engine, which by default is Google, and of course, I've recommended to everybody they switch their default to DuckDuckGo. You know, so when you, now that the address bar and the search bar are all the same thing on most browsers, and you know, you, and when you go to enter your web address, you can also just start typing search terms and start getting suggestions. And that means that behind the scenes, that as you type those characters, they're being sent to the search engine, and the search engine is starting to send back possible solutions to that, you know, based on hundreds of thousands of people who have started to type in those same characters, here's where they t tended to want to go, and here's their best guess at what website you're trying to get to, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But now, Firefox has added a new section, if you look carefully, uh, when you start typing that and a little window drops down with some possible suggestions, now there's a new area in that same list called Firefox Suggest. And uh, the trick is, it's not really doing the same thing, and I'll explain why here in a minute. So, you can turn this off, I have turned this off, but realize that Firefox needs money. I mean, these guys are doing great work, and... Honestly, they get most of their money already by taking money from Google to be the default search engine on the on Firefox, which must be a truly bitter pill to swallow, and supremely ironic given that Firefox is trying to tout privacy. But I understand. I mean, there are people. There's a lot of engineers and marketers and executives or whatever at Mozilla, you know, that have to be paid to develop this really amazing web browser, and to do that, they got to make money somewhere. They don't charge for the browser because nobody does that. They do have some other services you could buy, which, you know, they've got a VPN that you could pay for and some other things that most people probably don't even know about. They've actually, there's a Mozilla Foundation you can donate directly, which is what I do. But it's it's a, it's a not doing well. They are losing users uh, and their percentage of users on the internet overall, as far as, you know, web browser dominance is extremely low, single digits, uh, which is honestly scary. And I wish these guys the best and I understand why they're doing what they're doing. And you might want to consider leaving this on, and I'll explain why it's not, um, it's actually less of a privacy intrusion than it is for most of the search engines. So anyway, let me read this article from How to Geek, and it kind of, I kind of cut this up a little bit because um, there was an update to this article. So part of what I'm saying in the beginning is actually not going to be true. I'll try to call that out uh, because they've corrected it later in the article. But um, anyway, let me just read this to you, and we'll talk again at, on the backside. Firefox now sends more data than you might think to Mozilla, and that's the part that's not really true. To power Firefox Suggest, Firefox sends the keystrokes you type into your address bar, your location information, and more to Mozilla's servers. Here's exactly what Firefox is sharing and how to control it. This change was made as part of the introduction of Firefox Suggest in Firefox version 93, released on October 5th, 2021. As part of Firefox Suggest, Firefox is getting ads in your search bar. But that's not the only thing that will be news to longtime Firefox users. According to Mozilla, quote, Firefox suggests acts as a trustworthy guide to the better web, servicing relevant information and sites to help people accomplish their goals, unquote. Oh, I hate marketing speak like that. It's all euphemisms for at the end of the day, you know, saying we're trying to give you better results, but yeah, we're making money by doing it on the side. All right, anyway, back to the article. In reality, what this means is that when you start typing in your address bar, you won't just see standard search suggestions from Google or your current or your current default search engine. You'll also see Firefox suggest results pointing to web pages. Some of them are sponsored ads, but you can disable the ads. Firefox suggest is on by default. Mozilla's blog post on the subject says Firefox suggest is a quote-unquote opt-in experience, which was the case in September of 2021, but is now enabled by default in Firefox 93. And again, we're going to talk about that in a minute. However, as of Firefox 93's release in October 2021, Firefox Suggest is only enabled in the USA, for now. It's worth noting that, for many years, Firefox and other web browsers have had search suggestions in their address bar. So when you start typing WIN in your address bar, you may see suggestions for Windows 11 or Window Repair. 
This is accomplished by sending keystrokes to your default search engine as you type in the search bar, as Mozilla's support site explains. Unfortunately, all major browsers now use a combined address bar and search bar, so if you're trying to type in the address of a sensitive website to go directly there, your keystrokes as you type will be sent to your default search engine, and your search engine may be able to determine the website address you're typing in manually. Firefox Suggest is just more of that. In addition to sending your keystrokes to Google or whatever your default search engine is, Firefox will also send them to Mozilla. And again, I'm going to clarify that in a minute. Both your search engine of choice and Mozilla will return suggestions. Mozilla is also providing contextual suggestions for which it needs more data, including the city you're located in and whether you're clicking its suggestions. To deliver contextual suggestions, Microsoft will need to send Mozilla new data, specifically what you type into the search bar, city-level location data to know what's nearby and relevant, as well as whether you click on a suggestion and, what, and which suggestion you click on. All right, and this is the update. It says update. As of Firefox 93's release, Mozilla's documentation stated that Firefox would be sending queries to Mozilla's servers when Firefox suggest contextual suggestions were enabled, as explained below. However, it appears that Mozilla did not properly explain how this feature worked. Mozilla has since posted an update explaining that keystrokes, in other words, queries sent as you type, will not be sent to Mozilla with the default setting and that these quote-unquote smarter suggestions are instead an opt-in experience. In other words, with Firefox 93's default settings, Firefox will show you suggestions and ads, but it will source them from a local offline database in Firefox itself rather than sending your queries to Mozilla's servers. Okay, so let me back up and see if I can unpack that for you. So again, your address bar where you normally would type in, you know, www.amazon.com or www.facebook.com, is now, by default on most browsers, also a search engine. So it's also looking at you typing those characters and sending those characters to your default search engine in case you're typing words that might need to be interpreted as possible things you want to search on. So yeah, so what that means is when you're typing in an address, as this article said, which is really interesting, you know, you might be trying to not invoke your search engine, you know, because maybe you don't want Google to know that you're going to myreallyembarrassingmedicalproblem.com but they do uh, if they're their, if they're your default search engine because they're also going to be suggesting other things you might like to do based on the first characters uh, you know of those things that you're typing and now mozilla is doing the same thing and adding on to that list suggestions of their own but the key part is is at least currently in firefox 93 that experience is a, completely contextual, so it's only based on what you type, it's not based on anything in your history, anything they know about you, other than perhaps your location. Because again, you know, maybe you're looking for local restaurants, or you're, you know, you need to run to a local ready-med, or whatever. But those suggestions are not actually, the, the keystrokes you're sending are actually not going to Mozilla. They're being looked up locally, which means that there must be a huge download, actually. Part of, Mo, you know, part of Firefox now must include, you know, a whole bunch of potential search result things to show you as you start typing certain characters. So I God only knows how much space that must take, but at least it's, you know, it's more private. They're not sending that data to Mozilla. Now there are two levels of this. And I think the, the secondary one is where they might be sending some data. Anyway, so let me, let me tell you how to disable this. So if you go into your Firefox preferences, or it might be called options on windows, um, and look for uh, Firefox Suggest. And there's a little search thing at the top because there's so many settings, it's kind of hard to find things. But if you search on Suggest, for example, it should bring, you know, kind of bring you right to this. Uh, and it says right there, you know, address bar, Firefox Suggest. Choose the type of suggestions that appear in the address bar. You know, you, your browsing history. So in other words, sites you've been to before, which is private probably because it's probably just your local history that's, you know, Firefox may or may not know about. You know, bookmarks, open tabs, shortcuts, things like that. Uh, search engines, obviously, but then there's a new one at the bottom called contextual suggestions. And first of all, you can check that. And then if that is checked, there's a, a further refinement below that that says, uh, with a checkbox, it says include occasional sponsored suggestion. And right below that, it says helps fund Firefox development and optimization. So, yeah, I mean, I, I get why they're doing this. I mean, these guys got to make money somehow. And that, and Unfortunately, because no one wants to pay for anything anymore, the way we do that is with ads. And, and so they sell the ability to suggest things to you that somebody else has sponsored, which means that, you know, they are getting paid to float ideas to you that might get you to go somewhere and spend some money on someone else's behalf or go somewhere else and see ads or whatever. 
So I get why they're doing this. They're trying, apparently, to do it in a way that is privacy-preserving. You know, they're not building a dossier on you. They're not, you know, keeping that data up in Mozilla and selling it to other people. All they're doing, apparently, so far, is keeping, you know, they've downloaded with your browser, Firefox 93, a big database of suggestions to show you when you start typing certain things. And if you allow them to do this, and probably particularly if you follow any of those suggestions, they'll probably get a kickback. So that is what that means. That is what that's for. And if you're not comfortable with that, that is how you disable it. So there you go. There's your news and a couple tips of the week. All right, real quick, actually, this is still Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And instead of, you know, going through a lot of tips, they've got so many great resources. Uh, instead, uh, I'm going to suggest that you just go straight to the source. Uh, and there's a link in the show notes, but it's basically cisa.gov uh, and their Cybersecurity Awareness Month. If you look on there, there's something they call Cybersecurity Awareness Month Resources. Um, and you go to that page and there's kind of like a couple areas at the bottom that you have to expand to see what's in them. And there's one area at the bottom there that has a set of tip sheets uh, and they call them Cybersecurity Awareness Month 2021 Tip Sheets. And if you expand that tab area thing, accordion, whatever widget, if you expand that, there's a really nice long list there of a great uh, cybersecurity checklist and things that you should check out. And I'm not going to go through them all here, but um, again, that link is in the show notes if you want to find it. Um, there's a lot of great stuff there. It is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I will say that, you know, something you should absolutely do this month, even if you're on top of the stuff, even if you feel like you've got this stuff under control, you know, and you've got all the right privacy settings and security settings and, you know, everything set up well, take that knowledge and help someone else do the exact same thing. In fact, help three other people do that. We really can get to a sort of surveillance and security herd immunity state where opportunistic hacks and mass surveillance can be quelled. If enough people do enough of these basic things to stop all the tracking and the madness and just kind of raise your cybersecurity bar a little bit, just just that little bit more, you know, because if, you know, for everybody that does that, that means that's one less person to be infected uh, either mentally, emotionally through, you know, misinformation or through actual viruses and hacks that might spread to somebody else. So if nothing else, even if you feel like you're on top of the stuff, find some other people who don't and help them to get to your level. All right, real quick before we go, um, again, if you want those challenge coins, now is the time. Uh, you've got a couple weeks left for the promotion to become a patron and get one of those. And, you know, once you become a patron, we can interact on Discord, and that's a lot of fun. We can have a lot of back-and-forth discussions there. I've got some my best and worst gift guide for 2021, something I do every year, uh, usually right around Black Friday. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit earlier this year because with all the supply chain issues, people are, should, if you're not already, <laughs> to be doing your shopping earlier than normal because there's gonna be we're going to run out of a lot of stuff. You know, so yeah, you know, be a, be a good consumer and go buy your stuff early. But anyway, so I'm going to try to probably on, you know, in the November 14th show or and newsletter and whatever that around that time period is probably when I'm going to disseminate that list for, for this year. Uh, and I'm getting, I'm soliciting input from my patrons on, on Discord. So another great reason to join. Now I've got two interviews that are supposed to happen next week, one on Wednesday and one on Thursday that I'm super, super pumped about. But I don't want to, I don't want to uh, give them away here just in case they, I mean, I've been trying to get these guys for weeks to come together and schedules have been a problem. I think we're finally going to make this happen. So fingers crossed. Uh, but anyway, this should be for the next podcast. One of these two interviews will drop and then the other one shortly after that. Uh, really, really interesting topic. So um, anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's all hope that those actually come to fruition. And that is going to wrap up our show for today. Thank you again so much for tuning in. Thank you all to all my patrons who are already patrons. You guys are really helping me out. I very much appreciate that. Really, at this point, I'm looking for patrons mostly just to break even. And then if I get to that point, which I'm actually kind of closing in on that goal now, my next goal is to, you know, start doing some more marketing and reaching more people and finding other ways to, you know, improve the show. Really, I'm just going to plow all this stuff right back into the show. I mean, I'm retired. I don't, <laughs> I'm never going to make enough money of this that it's going to be a thing. But I'd like to, you know, if I can make some more money of this, I can start throwing more money at the show and, you know, get some marketing people involved, maybe do some transcripts. I don't know. There's all, I've got a long list of ideas of things I'd like to do. Uh, but step one is just uh, kind of covering my, my regular costs. Uh, that would be nice. So anyway, uh, go to patreon.com, search for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons if you're interested in getting the challenge coin. You can learn more about it on my website as well, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. That way you will definitely not miss any of the great shows that are coming on the pike. 
Check out the book on Amazon, Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. It'll make a great Christmas gift. Oh, by the way, um, there are actually probably going to be some really big sales coming up for these uh, from A-Press uh, between now and uh, I think they're, I think the sales actually are going to be around Black Friday. So I will let you know when those happen, and that would be a great time to pick up several <laughs> several copies for stocking stuffers. So anyway, year's coming in end quickly, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So hope you're all doing well. Hope you're all staying safe. We're maybe turning the corner again with COVID. So, you know, again... Get those shots, help other people get their shots, get your boosters if you need them. And maybe, just maybe, in 2022, uh, we can get back to some sense of normalcy. All right, take care, everybody. And until next week, as always, stay safe out there, and don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Bye.